Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to our show. We have gathered together from the cosmic reaches of the multiverse, two of the nerdiest geeks to be found. We proudly present the professor and her geeky girl, Mr. herself, Ace. And now it's time. Geeky Cool presents Professor and Ace. Hey everybody, welcome to Geeky Cool Presents Professor and Ace, episode 71, a very special episode. We've got my good friend Jason Brazier here with us. Uh, Jason and I met many years ago um, and uh, went over some of the really cool um, web series that he was doing at the time, and, and uh, we'll probably talk a little bit about that. But he's got a new documentary coming out and wanted to highlight this because uh, this documentary is having a live premiere in Springfield on Friday night at the Old Fox Theater building. So it's very exciting, Jason. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And I haven't seen you in a while. You I doing? know. I'm so glad to see you. I know you've been busy, and I know you've been working on this project. It's a labor of love. You've been working on it for a while. COVID, I know it's delayed some things and some other stuff going on, but uh, I'm I'm super excited that this is uh, this is coming on Friday and super excited for you because I, I know how much, uh, how much you've invested in this. So, well, thank you. Yeah. It's been a uh, <clears throat> long road. definitely. Yeah. Um, but one of the funner and less stressful projects I've ever worked on. That's awesome. Uh, just because, uh, you know, with documentary, you know, you can put it together within a very short amount of time if you've got all the stuff or, yeah just like the new Beatles documentary that Peter Jackson did. It took him three years to do. Right. Right. And it, you know, I think that's the fun part, the journey of it. And, you know, um, I wanted to get back into documentary filmmaking and I have over the last couple of years, I've been doing a work on, on a um, kind of a web series called my Ozarks. Right. Directing a few episodes here and there for, for, um, I said, I said, for boy, my Ozarkian came out there. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it leaked out there, but um, it'll do uh, that. Called Ozark of Vitality out in southeast Missouri, and yes, that's been a lot of fun to do. And I don't know, it's been very freeing. I've you know um, to really just kind of almost take a journalistic approach and investigate and kind of construct the story, and then figure out how we're going to do this and. Then you go one direction and the story goes another and you just kind of follow it and it makes it better. And it's kind of just a fun ride at times, you know, not that it's not stressful, but right. yeah, at times, but you know, there was a part when we were filming the interviews and I just had this idea with what he said in one of them. And I said, for a segment, can I get you in the ring and you show me some things? And I'm thinking he's not, he's, he's you know, and he said, oh, absolutely. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, I was a kid in a candy store and he beat I... my butt. I... <laughs> it was great. And I loved every second of it. And that's awesome. in the film. And, um, you know, but, you know, this guy, <laughs> I, like I said earlier, I wanted to get back to doing documentary filmmaking more. Right. And I wanted to get into it in college, and I had a terrible experience with a professor at Missouri State University who almost made me quit. Oh. Because he said, I went to sit down and talk to the dude, and I couldn't, I couldn't even get a sentence out. Like He's like, well, who are some of your favorite filmmaker, documentary filmmakers? And I didn't really, I wasn't naming any. I was just trying to think of what popped in my head first. And I, um, at that time, I think I had been watching like Kim Burns stuff, because I love history. And Right. I couldn't even get Burns out of my mouth before and get to um, uh, Warner Herzog or anybody because he just went off on a tangent for 45 minutes how stupid I was. And so I never I, – I didn't do documentary for years because of that situation. And I was working on a TV show here locally, a talk show called The Mystery Hour. Yes. Worked, I worked on that for about seven seasons, I think, mm -hmm. and behind the scenes on camera, and Manoli was a guest on it. And I was like, oh, who is, I've never heard of him. And they showed this picture of Andre, the giant, holding him up on his shoulder. Yes. And it just was like, I I was on camera, behind camera, and I was like, oh, that I've got to talk to this guy. And I finished another project, I think, before I talked to him called Barker Hole. 
Yes. And, we, and I finally, I said, just called him up and we went and had, um, I think breakfast or lunch one night. And it was, um, very, uh, I mean, I mean, I probably look like this. I was probably just like, Oh, tell me more. <laughs> um, and cause I mean, he wrestled with Randy Savage. He mm-hmm. wrestled with Andre. In fact, I think he even tag team with Andre a couple of times. Um, he, you know, he been at the same events as Harley race and dusty road. I mean, it's just, it was just crazy. You know, the names he was dropping and right. I was just like, I really want to tell your story. <laughs> and that's kind of how the whole journey began. And, the funny thing is, Larry, I, as a kid, before I even got into filmmaking, I wanted to be a professional wrestler. I can see that. Because I know <laughs> wrestling is one of your big things. Because we uh, talked about that, how you love yeah. wrestling. So I can, I can um, totally see that, yeah. I, I, and when I found out, you know, some people say it's fake. It's not fake. What I call it, I call it, the, I, I, the best way I can describe it is this. Wrestling, professional wrestling, is a live action choreographed stunt show. Right. Right. And it's both ath- athleticism and art form yes. and stunt work because you have to trust each other. If you do not trust each other, like there are some, like when I was younger, I started realizing like some wrestlers would look good losing and it wasn't. Right. A thing. And I started learning. And I, when I kind of found that, figured that stuff out, I didn't hate it. I liked it more. And so my friends and I got into, I mean, people would call it backyard wrestling, but we didn't do any like um, barbed wire crap like that, you know, <laughs> but we, <laughs> here's the funny thing, I have no idea how this happened. And you can see one of the events full on a, on a YouTube. It's actually on there. Well, we'll have to definitely search for that. Yeah. <laughs> I did a event. And somehow convinced that when I was going to church as a kid, convinced the youth pastors like, "Hey, we should to get the kids in. We should do a wrestling show." I was looking for some place that would let me wrestle that my parents wouldn't get on to me for, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and he's like, "That's a great idea." And I'm thinking, "Oh, I didn't think you'd say yes." <laughs> uh, and so I started actually directing and choreographing the matches and doing the storylines. Right. And we go in the day early that earlier in the day before the event that night, we would walk through the entire match and say, and we would, you know, rehearse it. Right. And that actually led to me getting into live theater, which led to me getting into film. Right. And so doing this film was kind of a, you know, coming like a full circle, I guess you could say. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I absolutely um, just in, enjoyed the entire process with Manoli because I really, I had done all this research and I'd also one of his fans who helped produce the, th- uh, the film. He actually did a lot of research that I, he just handed over to me oh, of wow. all these matches that he had, he had blocked every match that he had done. What was televised, how many belts he won. That was a godsend. And actually I have it right here. It's uh, this. <laughs> the there you go. Wow. He's got everything. I mean, I've got every, um, taping, <clears throat> which was helpful, but aggravating because I spent almost two years of this process trying to find a clip. I didn't care if it was a full match. I just wanted a clip of him, of Mike Pappas in the ring wrestling. Right. All I wanted. And I had a list of all of the televised matches and who recorded them and where and where they were at. 98% of the, when I tracked down, were all bought out by WWE. Oh. Uh. So I finally was like, ah, I'm going to have to add. I, I don't have anything to lose. I just need to ask. <laughs> so right, right. I was expecting either a hard no or a number, you right. know, an amount. And they wouldn't get back to me. So Manoli had one of his lawyer friends contact them just to see if we could get an answer. They wouldn't even answer him. Wow. And it was very aggravating, but it forced me to get creative more. And because I, I just didn't want to have pictures. Right. Something else. And so Manoli could actually still fit into his wrestling gear. Wow. 
And so I did these kind of dreamlike matches, like where I had him showing one of my friends, um, it was Madison Strain. We were filming at his dad's little studio in town. Um, shout out to them. They're oh, I've, I've done a lot of work with Mike and Madison. And um, it's so funny to me because uh, I just put one light shining down. We did a fog machine and turned off all the lights. So it's very dreamlike. I right. Yeah, See with it, and so we used that. It turned out really great, and um, but I told uh, Manoli, I said, "Watch as soon as we get ready to premiere the film. Finally, somebody's gonna go. Oh, hey, I have a tape of your match. And I'm gonna be like, oh my god, <laughs> right? Uh, but that hasn't happened yet. But I know that it's he's got to have a, he, at least one match in the archives at WWE Network." Right, WWE Network and WWE in general, they just want to own. They're the Disney of wrestling, right? They own everything, and half of it they're not, they're not even going to use. There's not, um, and you find out in the documentary more. But um, you know, Manoli wrestled for Vince Senior, not the current Vince McMahon, who's right, Vince right, Vince, yeah, World Wrestling Entertainment, and. But he has a story. I, don't, I we didn't put it in this, but I'm putting it. We are, I'll put I'm putting it in, in another side project as a companion piece. We're doing a podcast with um, using the stuff that we didn't use in the right. film. It just didn't fit narratively to tell the story. I'm actually using that. And we're doing an audio documentary podcast. Oh, good with that stuff. So, but yeah, his first meeting with Vince McMahon Jr. was not a good one. <laughs> I can imagine that might be true. Yeah, very it, insulting. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the entire process was a lot of fun. I mean, we just, you know, uh, we went to Smitty's Boxing Gym. So we weren't even in a real wrestling ring, which was probably not the greatest idea. But I took all the bumps. I didn't let him. Um, and because at that time, I didn't know there was a Mid-States Wrestling just 45 minutes down the road. I didn't know oh. that. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have went there. Right. And, and I would not have been a sore after, I feel like. Because <laughs> that ring was very, very, very stiff. But... I had a blast though. I oh, I will always remember that. But um, yeah. Anyway, I mean, that's it's just it's been interesting, and uh, we weren't planning to have the premiere this quickly. Actually, um, the we finished it a few couple months ago. Right. Finished, finished it, and all the music was done. And Manoli tells me, "Hey, I'm I've got colon cancer," and that hit me hard. Um, he's doing good. He actually good. Doing good. Um, but my grandpa had had something similar years right. ago. He passed away, and so he wanted to do the premiere, do a premiere in November. I said, "Let's see if we can push it to, to December, so I can we have a little more time to promote it." Right. And, um, he he's doing great, but for the premiere where 10% of the proceeds are going to a charity called fight colorectal cancer. That's yes. actually on the square. And, um, and he's been doing some work with them recently. So that's cool. And, um, we are doing a lot and, Oh, I guess we should talk about Medusa. Why have we not talked about her yet? I'm Let's just talk talking about Medusa. No, I, I'm I'm going, I've got questions for you, but you're, this is a great, this is wonderful having you <laughs> I'm talk. I'm, I'm, it. I'm rambling off. I'm sorry. Uh, but, no, uh, don't be sorry. This is great information. If I don't have to ask any questions, Jason, that's just perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about Medusa. You want to talk about Medusa? Um, we did a project with her, a video, and for a documentary, which we're still working on. We're just taking the long road, kind of like what we did with um, uh, Manoli's project. Yeah. And hers might take a little longer just because I've got a f box full of stuff. I've got to go through still to figure out how to digitize and what I want to digitize and whatnot. Right. For it. But I just asked her one day, I was like, Medusa narrating the flying Greek. And it's also a play on the words of the Greek mythology of Medusa. Right. right. And so I just said, I had nothing to lose. And I just kind of told her his story and what I was doing. And she agreed to it. No questions asked. And, yes. That's amazing. Um, she did a great job. It really gives the film even more backbone. I, you know, I feel that a, I don't know why, but I just felt that female narrator really was good for it, for the, his story. Um, it just right. works. 
and um, it, it, she's going to be here. I got to pick her up tomorrow night. <laughs> she's getting that's, to town. And that's amazing. Yeah. So, um, and uh, she'll be on TV on Color Ten, I believe, Friday afternoon or no Thursday afternoon. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good. That that way she's promoting it, talking about it. that's awesome. So yeah. Well, I did not realize Medusa was involved in this, so that's that's awesome. And so you mentioned that to me right before we went on the air. So um yeah. So let, let me throw some pictures up for people to see just to kind of so they can have their grasp on it. Um of course this is is the film that yeah. uh, that's premiering on Friday, Fox Theater, seven PM. Is that right? It's eight PM. The doors are the doors are opening at seven. Very good. And of course, this is a great scene. I, I love this picture well, with him flying right there. I actually just figured out who that wrestler is. He's getting ready to drop kick the crap out of. Because that was who what was he was doing. At the, I'm getting I'm pulling it up right now because it was uh, <laughs> Bill After just told me the other day. If I can find it where he Bill, oh, where'd he go? Um, here we go. Oh, uh, where'd he go? Oh, his opponent in this photo is Juan Caruso. So this is down in Mexico, I believe. Right. Mexico. Um, Because he was, he wrestled in Australia. He wrestled everywhere. Mexico and, of course, the U.S. Right, right. And, and of course, the the jacket here. You got to love the jacket. He still has this jacket. That's awesome. And um, it's, um, because you'll see in the opening credits of the film, he actually can still fit in it. That's that's Um, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I can fit in pants from two years ago right now. Never left. Uh, <laughs> <Me too. laughs> COVID was bad on my waistline, but uh, yeah, that's awesome. Oh, he froze up there. Oh, better. All right. Sorry about that. I don't. Ever occasionally that happens. I don't know what's going on. Um, so, so we've got that. So for people that don't know, kind of tell his story a little bit. Um, you know, you don't want to ruin the documentary. Just kind of yeah. give an intro. Well, for essentially. That- yeah, I don't want to give away too much. Come see the film. Um, exactly. Essentially, he it's a, it's his life story and how he got into wrestling, but also became a jeweler. And there's a lot of interesting dynamically dynamic threads mm-hmm. that connect all of that together, and that's what makes it such a unique story. And, um, and that's what attracted me to the story was just how it just wasn't a story about a wrestler. Right. You know, so that's what was cool about that. Well, and he's actually a jeweler in Springfield, Missouri. Yes, yes. So. He's been a jeweler for here for almost over four over forty years now. Yeah, that that's amazing. So um he grew up in Greece, came to the US to wrestle. Yeah, well he grew up in Greece and went to Australia to box. He became a boxer first. Oh, really? Somebody saw him and asked him if he wanted to wrestle and he didn't really think about it, but he said, I'll try, why not? And he enjoyed it, and he just kind of went from there. And then he tried to come to the U.S., and they didn't want him because they said it was too small. Right, right. So they sent him to Mexico to go with the Lucha Libres and the high flying Mexican wrestlers, and he made a name for himself there. And then he came back, you know. And um, it's a very, you know, interesting. A lot of early wrestling stories that you hear from people, they have kind of parallels, but every single one is a little different and because it's their, you know unique to their situation right. his situation was a lot of broken promises you know right it, it, we've heard that before with with wrestlers especially old-time wrestlers that uh, a lot of promises made that weren't kept yeah that's yeah and he's, he's he tells he's told some stories still that quite like, why didn't you say that in the documentary uh, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> but um there's a lot of just like, man, that's just, you know, some people just did business really crappy, you know, and right. He, he wrestled in the original Madison square garden. That's amazing. And he, a lot of the bigger wrestlers did not like him because he was a smaller guy and he was getting bigger crowd pops than they were. And, you know, one of his fans said, you know, whenever he could watch him as a kid, you would think that Hulk Hogan was walking to the ring for the world champion or whoever. And no, it was Mike Pappas. <laughs> you know, he just had an impact on people and didn't really realize it. Well, I'm sure people could relate to, he's kind of the underdog there. 
being oh, smaller yeah. and everything else. And oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. He um and this story's not in the documentary, but it will be in the podcast documentary because it it, it was a great story, but narratively it just didn't work in the flow of things. But he tells a story of how he got his jaw dislocated. And somebody ducked in the corner of a battle royal and just <laughs> hit him. Oh. And he goes, I had to, and he hit it back in and kept wrestling. Wow. And I'm just like, oh, the, in God's name, did you, <laughs> I couldn't do it. And, you know, then there were stories that he told about uh, there's a big wrestler back in the day named Haystacks Calhoun. Oh, who's yeah. Four or 500 pounds. And they were supposed to be doing this bit where Manoli was in this match. And, you know, they do this where you step on the ro bottom rope and look like you're choking the person. Right, right. <laughs> Haystacks Calhoun was like 400 some odd pounds. He was literally choking him. <laughs> Manoli's like, I literally thought I was going to die. <laughs> and it's just... You know, it's so funny to hear those stories. You know, he he um, wrestled with Rocky Johnson, the Rock's dad. Right, right. And um, he, I mean, it's just so crazy. And we actually got this close to the Rock. Oh. That close. We made it to the gate, his gate, essentially. Not like we actually went to his house and knocked on his gate. I'm not saying that. Right, right. <laughs> but Do we went through channels and. Right. To his people, to the gatekeepers, and that was interesting. And they loved it. It was just they're, they actually if they didn't tell us no, they basically just said his schedule is booked for the next two years. Right. And so, but the fact that they didn't tell me no, I thought, exactly. I thought that was awesome of them because um, it's connect. You know, because he wrestled with his dad and right. actually. Gosh, it wasn't a few months before The Rock's dad passed away that Manoli, I think it was a few months or the year before, he was at a, some event and he got a picture with him and they were talking that they remembered each other and they even traveled together some. Right, and right. so there is that connection and that thread there with The Rock. And um, But um, I, I, I was just really humbled that his gatekeepers were so nice because they don't have to be nice because they get right. stuff all the time and they were very very nice and i was very grateful for that because it was i was expecting that who the heck do you think you are type of thing but nope they just said hey this is really great but we just he's he's booked for two years <laughs> now right. hey you know what i just appreciate you getting back to me and acknowledging my presence thank you <laughs> unlike uh Unlike WWE. Say what? <laughs> Unlike WWE not getting back, so. You know, I don't like that either, but, um, you know, it's a weird line to walk because some of my favorite matches growing up were in WWE when it was WWF. Right. Um, and um, it was, it was, it was really good. Um, sorry, hold on. My daughter is trying to call me. I told her, hey, I want a podcast. Oh, sorry. Hold on, Larry. I don't know if you can No edit. problem at all. You take that. It's fine, Jason. Yeah. Hey, I want a podcast. What's up? Okay. Well, if you can't get everything, I'll come down after and I'll grab it. All right. Bye. Yeah. Anyway, um, sorry. daughters are that way. They're like, "What? What do you mean you can't come to the phone right now? I'm, I'm the most important thing in here." So, yeah, I know. <laughs> no, she's she's sweet. Um, but, um, but yeah, WWE like it had some of my some of the greatest matches that I'll always remember as a kid. And you know, I think what's changed is they went public. They became right. a traded entity right but prior to that they did not have anybody else to listen to but the fans right and i feel that that is what is missing now mm. and i think it shows i don't think they care but i think that's where it shows there are some diehard wwe fans and that's fine but i can't watch it anymore yeah 
I can't watch them anymore. Um, the only thing I'll ever get WWE Network for is to go back and watch all, all the old ECW and WCW pay-per-views and some Attitude Era stuff. Right. And, and it's not because the, the Attitude Era was raunchy or anything. It was just it was wrestling. What WWE is doing right now is not wrestling. In fact, Vince doesn't let his wrestlers call it that. They have to call it sports entertainment. And they are a sports entertainer. They're not a wrestler. And right. I'm, you're called World Wrestling Entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> you would think so, yeah. Um, but, and don't get me wrong, Vince changed a lot of things for wrestling. He did. Mm -hmm. But it's just, I feel like their product is very out of touch with um, fans. And I think it's silly that a lot of them go, well, we're not we're not going to go back to the attitude era. We're above that. We're above hardcore matches. We're above this. We're above that. I mean, I don't care if you have a hardcore match. I just want to see a good wrestling match. Right. I don't care. It, it, hook me in. You know, they had storylines that lasted like three or four months. And right. Tested. They suspended your disbelief. The whole Austin, Stone Cold Steve Austin and McMahon. Right. You know, Saying it to the man, everybody um, really, really got that and got sucked into it, and they leaned into it. And right. then, it was a couple of years ago. Somebody they were trying to make um, Charlotte Flair a good guy and Becky Lynch a bad guy. The fans didn't want that. They wanted Charlotte to be the bad guy and Becky to be the good guy. And one of these wrestlers who made his name during the Attitude Era. Got on Facebook. He's a back. He's behind the scenes guy. And was like, "That's not the story we're telling you. Why are you? Why are you not listening to it?" It's like, mm. <laughs> "Why are you not listening to the fans?" You come to the from the era when somebody booed you. You leaned into it, and the crowd went wild. Now you're saying, "No, you're wrong." Blah 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 blah. And it's like, you're out of touch, man. <laughs> right. And that's why I'll I'll spend my money on. AEW, I will spend my money on New Japan, which is New Japan's awesome, and then Game Changer Wrestling, GCW, they're like the new ECW, and they are crazy. I've not seen awesome. this one. Oh, <laughs> look them up. They, uh, one, one time they did a pay-per-view, and it was it was called Backyard Wrestling. I was like, oh, I've got to see this. <laughs> they literally went into one of the wrestlers' backyard, put a wrestling ring, had people in the neighborhood get lawn chairs out, that's and then, awesome. And then they did the really cheesy stuff you did as a kid. They made a really terrible fake entrance way, and they had people standing there with sparklers as you walked out here. <laughs> I love it. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm sold. These guys are amazing. <laughs> that's that's bringing it back to your kids. Oh yeah. time, right? Oh my gosh, that's great. So GCW is great. Um, Impact Wrestling is also great. NWA is awesome. I love NWA. Yeah. You know, yeah. Billy Corgan, the Smashing Pumpkins, he's revived that brand. And, um, you know, I love what he's doing with that. He's, he's leaned into the old school and people are eating it up because they're, they're doing old studio tapings that they would have done back in the 70s and 60s. Right, right. You know, um, I would rather watch that. Heck, the Mid-States Wrestling Show that I went to a month ago was a more entertaining thing than WWE was to me. And I don't say that as a, to be to be spiteful. Like I was genuinely brought, hooked in and entertained by Mid States Wrestling when they were in Springfield last, and what Jason Jones and them guys did just for that small of a crowd was just freaking phenomenal. And I was like, this. I, and I told him, I said, you guys put on a better show than WWE. Like, you you guys hooked up me in, right? And maybe, it's been my disbelief, and I enjoyed every freaking second of it, which is what you want. Right. I'm not saying that WWE wouldn't be fun to watch live, but I just, I'm there to watch wrestling and to get, so, you know, have the storytelling told to the wrestling. And I just don't right. feel like I do that anymore. So that's just my it's opinion. Just, it's just all interviews before and after and everything else. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there's been people complaining that the first hour of Raw one time was literally. Somebody coming out to the ring, mouthing off, back to the mistake. No wrestling for like an hour. And then when I saw e AEW, when they first started coming out, it was like, this is like w old school WCW meets ECW meets New Japan. 
and it's that's a breath of fresh air, you know. Right, right, right. Even during the pandemic, they were working with Impact Wrestling, NWA. They were helping each other. Mm. And WWE doesn't do that. No. Now they would say differently, I think. But they were like, well, we, you know, we they have progress wrestling is kind of a training ground for certain things and so on and so forth. But it's like you own them essentially. You're making them a train. You're you're owning them. You're not right. <laughs> Right, not, not the same thing. And anyway, that's my humble opinion. You know, I could be wrong. Medusa could watch this and say, "Well, actually, you got this wrong." And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But this my perception as a fan. That's what it comes across like, and perception right. is reality. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, and if your fans are feeling that way, then I mean, I mean, we we see that with uh, a lot of the mainstream stuff. Uh, in comics and 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 even in movies where you're like oh well we're gonna do this even the fans don't want this and then you're like wonder why sales are down wonder why this is having a problem well that's you're not what, listening to your fans well yeah that, 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 that's the star wars the most recent yeah. trilogy in the bag you know right uh, right and then you got favreau and filoni who gave kathleen kennedy the middle finger and secretly put skywalker luke in the <laughs> mandalorian and crashed Disney Plus, and then she's all mad trying to fire people and raise chaos, and all Disney's going, this is going, hey, whoa, 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 these guys just made us money. What are you doing? Right. The ratings on this were huge. And people started getting Disney Plus subscriptions again. Yeah, we got to keep this around. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, and, and that's, that's you know, I mean, I mean, Larry, did you hear what she wanted to do with Star Wars? I knew she was trying to basically whitewash everything that was Skywalker and get rid of any any references there. But she was going to with the plan with Ryan Johnson's trilogy. They were going to go millions of year, billions of years in the future, where all of this stuff that has been known in Star Wars is basically extinct, and they were just going to use Star Wars in the name. No Jedi, nothing, and then they were just going to do something completely new and different and use the name. And I'm like, that is the biggest bunch of BS and stupidity I've ever heard in my life. Exactly. And, and it's like, and that's what Favreau and Filoni did with that, with, with Mandalorian, is they proved, hey, you can tell a story within the Star Wars universe and still be original. Exactly. And play within the rules of the universe and still be original. Yep. Something amazing, and she said, and, and I just would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in that meeting after that happened. I mean, she would have been so I know she had to have been livid, and I know that Favreau had to be sitting over there just laughing at her. I, right. you know, on the inside, because it's like going, He just showed you, and you can't stand it. And you know, I and I don't know all the details, obviously, but she really pushes the. You know, I'm a feminist, but then there's extreme toxic right. feminists. Right. That's what Kathleen Kidd kind of falls into. And I think she was mad that it was Favreau who did it. Right. You know, and, you know, even on the Rise of Skywalker, JJ told Disney, I will come back and do it, but Kathleen can have no creative say. Got it. He brought in George Lucas. To help him tie right. everything together. Lucas even directed a couple of scenes. She saw the cut. She exercised the very smallest clause that she had in her contract and made him go back and shoot 60 some percent of that movie or whatever. Which is crazy. And it was just she wasted money. Right. I'm like, you know what you need to do? Just be a, a, you know, just be a douchebag producer and just take credit for the great things that these guys did just because you didn't interfere. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, but no, 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 we can't do that. You know, and like, I can't even go back and watch The Force Awakens. Every time I go back and watch it, I hate it a little bit more each time because I'm watching a fan film with a budget. Right. I sh- shouldn't be watching a fan film with a budget. They, if Doctor Who, after these many years, can sit there and come up with new stories that still play within things and make some things connect and whatever, there's no excuse for right. your film. You have the kingdom 
Right. They, and they're like, oh, we didn't plan it out. We didn't. I heard that they didn't plan it out. They just wanted to do like George did, and just kind of make it up as they went along. I'm like, first of all, it's stupid because he, he had no choice. Right. You have no choice. You really were stupid to not outline that entire trilogy. Anyway, we right. went on a Star Wars there. Sorry. <laughs> Well, as I'm sitting here in my Mandalorian shirt, so oh yeah, uh, yeah. Well, absolutely, yeah. Grogu, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so so back to the film. J just uh, yeah. what what were what was something that really surprised you when, when you were making this film? Something that really surprised me. Yeah. Um, how much better shape that man is than I am. <laughs> uh, you know, right. I I mean, I, when I was in the ring with him, and he was just even trying to show me how to throw a proper forearm in wrestling, and you know, here I am taking these bumps, and I'm saying, I tell, you know, clothesline me, and he clotheslines me, and stuff like that, and he, uh, you know, we get done filming and all that, and I, I get out, I, he leaves, and I get out to my car, and I just go, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to call my brother because my my entire right arm was going numb. Oh, so I had to have him come over and pop my back, and you could feel it. I just landed wrong, you know. And here's Manoli, you know, just calling me the next day. How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm like, I feel like I've been hit by a truck. He goes, Well, I feel great. <laughs> just like, <laughs> it, how old is he now? He's Oh God! You know, I, 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 he always says he's not a fan of telling his age. Uh, well, and we will leave that a secret then. But uh, yeah, we'll he's been secret. wrestling for quite a while. I mean, yeah. you know, man, was in the seventies, right? For the most part, seventies, yeah, early eighties, seventies. Yeah, he, he he was out of it by by the time before WWF really took off, right? And all that, but um, he. Uh, you know, he could run laps around most people still. That's that's wonderful. That <laughs> is wonderful. Yeah, he's he's. You know, I'm like, what is your diet? Just tell me what you do. I'm just gonna start following that <laughs> regimen. <laughs> no doubt, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and it could, you know, um, I still think he eats the old Mediterranean diet from back home. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, and it's working for him. Hey, you know, nothing wrong with that. So if, if you know, this this documentary hits, it's a huge success, gets picked up, everybody knows the spotlight, now knows the name Jason Brazier for documentaries about wrestlers. <laughs> and they want you to do another wrestling documentary. Who do you want to do? Oh, God. I've got a bunch of documentaries I want to do. Yeah. Because I've really been... Getting into experiments, I got into a lot of experimental film during quarantine. Yeah, um, I, I remember some of those because some of those I, I we we posted even on Geeky Cool. Yeah, yes, thank you, thank you for that. And um, that's been very that was very freeing to do some experimental film and yeah, like on the art side of things. But I discovered other genres of film, especially within documentary. Documentary is used a lot for experimental stuff. But right. if I'm gonna if I was gonna do it, I mean, I'm still I'm doing one. On, we're working on one for Medusa. Right. Uh, but if I had to do another wrestling one, I would want to do one on Terry Funk. Um, nice. Would love to do one on Terry Funk, or I would love to do one on the King of the Japanese Deathmatch tournament they had back in the '90s that Mick Foley, Cactus Jack, or Mankind, we would call him, wrestled in, and he wrestled Terry Funk during that. But that match is legendary. But I would love to just dive into the whole tournament itself. Right. Talk about how, you know really the process of that because that's kind of was the big thing that changed things if i remember correctly and because that after that frontier martial arts wrestling came in and that's kind of what the style they did over in japan um uh but terry funk i love terry funk and he's not doing too well right now from what i hear i think he's got dementia um oh. but, um i would love to do one on terry funk i would love to do one on the japanese deathmatch tournament um yeah. And another wrestling one. Um, you know, I'd like to do another one on a uh, some of these other guys, kind of like Manoli, who laid the foundation right. that people have kind of just pushed aside. 
or and I have my opinions on who did that and why they did that, but um, there's so many of them that you know because I could sit here all day and say, oh, it'd be fun to do one on Sting, but WCW did that for years, right? Um, right. It was something that was completely different that he's never done. Then you got my attention. Um, mm. Dark Side of the Ring is a great show on Vice, and they've been doing a lot of doc. It's a great documentary. It's a wrestling documentary show, and they take on. I mean, they took on the Chris Benoit incident, and man, that was rough. Um, but you know, there's so many wrestlers like you can um, could do. I, I mean, the female wrestlers. I mean, like Medusa. You've right. got um, you, you know, um, anything from NWA early on, like Dusty Rhodes would be great, but. WWE, yeah. all that stuff, and they've right. done stuff like that, but that, that, I, I don't feel that they are going, they're not in the in depth as they could be with it. You know what I mean? Sure. But, but again, that's them. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, to me, I, to me, they're sitting on a treasure trove of stuff, and of course, they also have a, a warehouse that has all this stuff just sitting in it. And I'm like, why are we not turning this into a museum? Right. I mean, Buddy, I mean, you're sitting on, but I don't know why they don't want to. I think they're personally. I think they're going to be getting sold soon. I think that's what they're preparing for. That may be true. Um, yeah. Um, I think that it would behoove them to make a WWE museum. Going back to all, because I mean, they've got the WCW Nitro set just sitting in there. Right. Right. And I'm like going, you just gonna let it sit there i'm like indiana jones i'm all like it belongs in a museum <laughs> <laughs> and and, and it, yeah, i think that's the thing about documentary stuff for me larry is i when well, i also love history and i have, at one point mm. wanted to be an archaeologist right and to me documentary stuff is kind of at my way it's kind of like i'm becoming like a visual archaeologist slash preservationist where I'm able to dive into these things and preserve a story in a unique and creative way and um, to share with people. And I think that's, I think it's important. And I think that's why documentary filmmaking is important. Um, I, I do think there's commercialized documentary filmmaking, which yes. is nothing wrong with. I mean, there, there are some great documentary films, um, in fact, I'm going to finish watching the Beatles get back tonight because um, that's what you would call a source documentary. There's right. no interviews. They just basically took 160 hours of footage and they had to watch it and edit it to a point where they could tell a story. That's what, that's, sort, that's a source documentary. Um, you're not really shooting anything new. You're just taking right. it from the source and editing it and doing different things to do it to you know tell the story. And for that film, it was enhanced, the, the enhancement of the film and making it look better and sound better and telling a different story than what was told and let it be. Um, right. You know, then you got your regular filmmaking or documentary where you have the interviews and cut things together too. I mean, there's so many different ways of doing it. Um, and, you know, there are some people that um, kind of indulge in stretching the truth with them too. Yes. Um, Warner Herzog, I guess, is really known for that, even though he's made some of the best documentaries, one of my favorites was Grizzly Man. But now I gotta go back yeah. and watch it because he he did a thing where he's talked about like, well, if it, if you can, he'll he'll manipulate the stuff the story a little, which I'm not a fan of, but right. um, he he do, he's done that. But nobody cares because he's so good, I guess. But for me, I'm more of a I, f I shouldn't have to manipulate a story to make it work. The story should right. just be there. That's just me. That's fine. A good story, um, right? Yeah. And, it's kind of like putting the puzzle together backwards sometimes, but at the end of it, you can have a really nice puzzle, you know, a nice little portrait to look at. And I think that's why documentaries are so popular. I mean, you've got the uh, Rockumentary, you've got yes. true crime. Now that's a big thing on stream. It is. And um, it's, you know, <laughs> preserving a true crime story can 
you know, you can get very unethical very quick in some of those, mm-hmm. but sometimes you're just cashing in, I feel like. But again, you to each their own. Like one of my favorite filmmakers is Guy Madden. He's from Winni- he's from uh, Winnipeg, and he does a, he's an experimental filmmaker. But he did a documentary. But the way he did his documentary was was just Guy Madden for you. He um, it was called My Winnipeg, and he does it where he's traveling on a train in his mind, and he has a kid playing him on the train as they're traveling through his memories. Wow. And then he also would, he wanted to mythicize, um, would myth, mythicize Winnipeg. And so there are quite a few times where he obviously goes off and you're like, well, this is not real, but he makes it feel real, like almost like a fable. Right. Um, but he, he, but you know, that's what you're getting when you're going in. It's not like I'm going into a Herzog film and, you know, because I think I'm going to see something that's all, tr- you know, truth. And yeah. he altered like a little something or left something out just to make it better or whatever. But, um, you know, I think that's where the, the fine line in filmmaking can be is, you know, there's you want to, as a filmmaker, manipulate your audience because you want them to get into it. Right. But you got to be careful. And, you know, when you're telling documentaries, because you don't want it to manipulate the story you want to manipulate the audience and so that's you gotta figure out that that balance right right and i, and I keep referring back to the beatles one because that's what i've been watching and i've been watching interviews with peter jackson and he's talked about you know like his first cut was 16 hours long i went uh, wow. wow i will take it off let's just let's sit down let's just get popcorn yeah. I'll, I'll do it you know i'm that guy who will watch the extended cut of lord of the rings you know let's do it right oh yeah me too yeah. Um, but then after COVID and all that, he broke it down into, you know, three, almost two and a half, three hour pieces. And I, I like that though, because it's almost like they've done it in chapters because each one that closes off and continues. And he said that cutting it any shorter would have been a travesty. Mm, I can see but that. He still has, I think a longer cut as a full film, but I, I could see him releasing that. And, you know, rather, because since the film, the series is on Disney plus, I could see him actually releasing the longer version of the entire film as like a special edition Blu-ray or something. Sure. It's like, right. You know, who knows, but it's, um, it's interesting. I, I, it's just the stuff that people are doing with documentary filmmaking in general, just, it, it actually excites me. Because when I go to see a regular movie nowadays, you know, um, I'm all about escapism and mm-hmm. things like that. I mean, good lord, I'm wearing an American genre film archive shirt, <laughs> but um, I feel like I had this argument the other day with somebody. Guillermo del Toro's movies get ready to come out or be resurrected yeah. at the Mountains of Madness. Yes, and I said, great, just don't let James Cameron be attached to it. <laughs> and somebody was like, "Why would you do? Well, why, why would you diss James Cameron?" I'm, like, I'm not dissing the man. The man's done great things for cinema. But the thing that killed that movie was he said it had to be all shot in 3D because that was the kick he was on, and um, it was too much to film. Right, right. And that killed it. Um, so for it to be resurrected for streaming. I'm like, okay, great. Just don't do it in 3D. Right, right. Just let James go keep making his Avatar movies, I, which I don't care for anyway, personally. But um, I, it, it, that there's just that argument of, you know, um, resurrecting films or how film, basically how what I'm trying to get. At, it's like a lot of films nowadays kind of follow the same format or formula a little bit. Yes. And mm-hmm. especially, um, I haven't seen the new Ghostbusters film yet. I'm a huge Ghostbusters fan, so I need to go see it before I make a judgment on it, obviously. But um, there's a lot of people who um, adored it, and that makes me excited to see it as a fan, because I love that. But, you know, 
my hope is that they didn't like follow the normal and it's, it's kind of hard to say because I know every story is different, but there's always this formula that Hollywood kind of follows. Oh, yeah. And I, it's refreshing when somebody kind of is able to sneak out of that a little bit on a film. So that's kind of what I'm hoping for. We'll see. But that's why I've been watching more independent films, right. watching documentaries, watching whatever, just because it's more original and you don't have to worry about somebody telling you how to make it and right, right you know that's what was fun about flying greek is that it just you know there were two or three cuts where it was like ah, this just isn't working you know i wanted it to make it over an hour but i came to realize i was really forcing it and i was like i can tell everything perfectly within 45 minutes right I, you know for his story and then i said anything else i didn't use i will mold that into an audio documentary so it can be a companion piece right and so that's what we're doing that's, that's what i did it was just like let it be what it is because i saw i forget what filmmaker it was um who said this but he said i don't believe in a short film versus a feature film a film is a film right if my film is 10 minutes long and it did more for you in 10 minutes than an hour and a half long movie did I've done my job as a filmmaker. Right. right. Story and he was absolutely correct. And I can't for the life of me remember which filmmaker that was that said that, but I was like, he's right. And mm -hmm. we're kind of going in the full circle too, because when we first started in cinema, we were making short films. Right. Silent films. I that's one of the I I would actually like to make a feature length silent film. Just not not to be like to make it look like a silent film, like I would genuinely love to take the digital camera and everything and use old techniques while using this digital camera and trying to make something that looks like it's been lost in some basement for just decades. And people, some people ask, like, why do you want to do that? I'm like, I'm kind of a Filmmaker out of time. I love watching these guys do these old films, like the original right. Faust that um, Murnau did. Dear God, if it wasn't for that film, you wouldn't have had Metropolis. Exactly. Right. Because Metropolis took a lot of the special effects that they did in Faust. Right. And they got made it better. And it just keeps building from there. But without those films laying that foundation. Right. Right. And I love watching how they used to do those old tricks. It's just so cool to me. Whereas we can do it now digitally, that's great, but there's just something more artful about that. Uh, I agree. To take that journey and just do something like that that's completely old school. And, you know, with some, you know, with, I'll have more technology because let's just face it, doing something on film is way too expensive. Right. Exactly. But I'd like to take the digital thing. That would be a Bets of a Dream project that I'd love that, to do. That's a <laughs> great project. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen our show before, but uh, AJ, um, also known as Ace, she and I will uh, have our, our time for we talk about, we take a five-year period of older movies and, and give our favorites and, and talk about each of those movies. And we did the 20s, and we just, you know, that, it's such a cool time because filmmaking was so much in its infamacy, and well, you had the talking starting to happen at the end of the 20s, but a lot of it still was silent movies and yeah all filmmaking early on was experimental right they were just figuring things out right there are some great gems like where you're like you get lost in it and you're like wow there was no talking in this and i've even told my film classes that i'm like that's what filmmaking is i should be able to take dialogue out and tell you what's going on visually without right. giving it away. And some people were just like, what? what are you talking about? And I'm like, uh, there's even stuff that came out during that time that's freaking creepy that yeah. I don't I don't know how they did it for back then. And some people in my classes I was teaching, like, no, there wasn't. I said, ah, watch The Dancing Pig and the silent film of that. And you know what you're watching is somebody in a costume, but for the 1920s, right? I 
don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very, um, you know, but it is, of course, there's no Sferatu and things like that. Exactly. But, um, and, it, you know, there's still places that those shooting locations still exist. Right. And I'm like, oh, God, that's a dream trip sometime when COVID's done. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I don't know. That's, you know, I just love filmmaking in general. I, don't know. I, uh, about- I know you do. I, now, is there some, is there a genre of film, and maybe it's silent films, that you haven't done yet that you want to do? Because I know you've done, you've done post-apocalyptic, you've done horror, you're doing documentaries now. What, what do you want to do that you haven't had a chance to experiment with? Well, I definitely would like to do, um, well, two. Well, one of the, I, I mean, I did a silent project. I directed a couple of episodes of Shadowbound a couple years ago, Nathan Sheldon's project. But um, I really want to go all out. That was a web series, and it was great. Right. I yes. want to do, like, hardcore, like, we're going to go out and shoot, like, an hour and 20-minute silent film. And we're going right. we're gonna to make it and shoot it as old school as possible. And we're gonna t- we're filming on digital, but we're gonna figure out well how they do this effect, and we're gonna try to make that work with our camera, right? And see what we and marry the two together. And I also want to do a musical. I would Ooh. love to direct a musical. Um, I've had ideas for I've had a couple of ideas for a while, but nothing that's you know I felt in my gut I needed to jump to. But I would love to do a musical at some point. Um, I love period pieces. I would love to do another period piece besides a Western. Right. Um, I have a vampire detective story that I started as an audio podcast, but I'd love to even try, take him and do an actual 1930s noir, but just with a vampire detective right? Uh, for fun. Um, take that would it, be awesome. 100% serious. Um, I'm a big fan of the films of, Tur- of Tarkovsky, Andre Tarkovsky. Yeah. Um, Stalker was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to do some more. Um, what I'm not seeing a lot of cerebral type of sci-fi because sci-fi doesn't always have to be um, space lasers and right. What, you know. And that's kind of what Drifter was born out of. It didn't have to have lasers and whatnot, and we focused on that. But, you know, I would love to do some more cerebral, realistic sci-fi. I've got some ideas for that, but it just comes down to, you know, timing. Like, I feel like I could probably pull off doing a silent film because I don't have to worry about sound, so that cuts out. Right, right. cuts out a lot of work, um, but I can cost around the visual and how I want to tell it on the effects, you know, and I can shoot it kind of in a similar fashion, but I can, you know, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I could, uh, I, I can make that work, you know, to my life, my new life schedule more than trying to shoot a period piece right now. Sure. Um, but, um, well, I say that cause I would look, I would want the silent film to be a period piece, but when you take audio out of it, you don't, have to, <laughs> it cuts a lot of stress out. I remember sure. on shadow bound. I was like, Oh, I can actually just talk to them and, while we're filming <laughs> and direct them on the screen. So um, right, right. yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. I would love like stuff like that. I'd love to do. I've got some documentaries. I'd love to do as you know, I mentioned the wrestling ones, but I've got a couple of um, personal ones. I'd like to try and do at some point. Um, kind of one of them is inspired by guy Madden's work of how he did my Winnipeg. I kind of want to do something like that for my hometown where I grew up, but mm-hmm. have, have the focus be on um, imagination. Have a kid in a small town, um, take that approach to it. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you know, and if there's you know, just like flying Greek, there could just be something that comes across my path. Right. Ooh, I don't know. It just when you know, you know mm-hmm. when it's there. You know, because it's just kind of like. Um, that's the excitement of a documentary too. I don't know. I, I, I kind of write it as I go. I kind of am finding the story as I go. Whereas if I'm going to do a silent film, I'm going to have to sit down and write it first, you know, which is nothing wrong with that by any means, but they're both very different approaches, but mm-hmm. both very exciting in, in their own way. 
That's awesome. So one more question for you real quick, Jason, and then we'll let you go. I know you're busy. You got a busy week going on. Um, so the streaming service comes to you and says, we've got the rights. We're going to reboot Power Rangers. We want you to direct. How do you do that? How, what's your vision for the new Power Rangers? <laughs> I know you thought this, so I know. <laughs> oh, Larry. All right. Well, well, first, I liked the film that came out a few years ago. Yeah. I thought it was good. I liked what they did. Um, they stripped down a lot of elements that made the TV show what was kind of that tongue-in-cheek fun part of it. Right. Like the communicator watches and um, things like that. Um, but it wasn't bad. I loved how they did that film. It really did. Yeah, I love it because I, I had fun with it. So, yeah. Yeah. I think I would uh, – my thought process was kind of um, – had some similarities, but I always thought – just let the story be what it is. You know, it's about a bunch of teenagers. You know, right. they took the serious route with the teenagers, which I liked. I, that's something I would have loved to have done. Um, I like what they did with the alien spacecraft land that made sense for Zordon and whatnot. Um, but for me, I feel like it needs to be approached more like War of the Worlds. Mm. Um, and I'm talking like the Spielberg. War right. of the world where the robots were already underneath the earth and then they were shooting in like like lightning and rising out of everything. I feel that that um, is what would be needed. I feel like my approach would be Rita um, mm -hmm. would come back to earth because uh, after 10,000 years, she's free. Um, <laughs> right. Well, exactly. You have uh, to add that in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> she basically um, awakens the robots that she had on there going back to prehistoric times and shoots, has all her guys go in there and, you know, her little minions do that. And then I would have one of those robots. Um, be um, Goldar, which was the guy with the wings. I wouldn't make him as bulky as they had him, but I definitely see him as more of a Greek type of figure, like how they would have myth myth mythologized him. And um, the Power Rangers are all descendants of orig the original people from back in those times. And back when they first hit... And the uh, they would find the morphers in a similar way that they did in this movie. Right. Last movie, I, of course, so I would change that up a little bit so they could have um, be it would be so it'd be different, obviously. But I think that's what makes it um, unique. And then you know, go into uh, you know, I would make the their outfits more armor based, but I would base them more on the original um, TV show, um, right. but make it make a more armor designed a little bit more where it makes sense and not just all cloth. Right. But, um, I would take that route and then I would end it with um, Rita dying or passing on somehow basically passing on and waking up what would we the, the you know the whole green ranger thing right and then i would i would have the green ranger kind of be like the darth vader of a trilogy of that i like it all so, right well <laughs> and, and i knew you had thought about that because i'm like okay wait this wait is, this is kind of a, a, a softball question that I can ask Jason because I know his fandom is so strong here with the Power Rangers. So, all right. Well, Jason, thank you again for coming on. For those that are watching, make sure Friday night, 8 o'clock, it opens at 7, The Flying Greek at the Fox Theater downtown. I mean, what a great place to be able to watch it. In fact, I used to go to church there 
on the oh, Hawks yeah. Theater back when it was a church. Um, so uh, uh, an awesome event. Make sure you guys come out, check it out, and, and uh, check out the Flying Greek because this looks like a ton of fun. 45-minute documentary. It's not going to take your whole night. You can go do this and grab dinner also. So um, yep. you can get your tickets at the door, or you can get them at Manoli's Jewelers in person to meet Mike Pappas himself at his store, or you can get them um, online. There's a link at Manoli's Jewelers.com. And, and I do have that down below, the link that you guys can get that online. So make sure you guys check that out. Um, Jason, real quick before we leave, I, I always kind of give shout outs to everybody else that uh, in our community that's doing similar things. So let me do that real quick if that's all right. And then we will sign off, my friend. And, and again, thank you so much for coming on. So uh, we, we have, I mean, our area is loaded full of people doing really cool podcasts like this. Um, we've got um, our friends Keith and Gary over Pop Culture Minefield. And I believe you were on their show. So I was, recently. I was. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, you'll notice that my show is a little more tame, um, not as many curse words, <laughs> and that's just a way to, it, for people that know, we, we always joke with them because uh, Gary can't keep from, from you know, having the language, and that's okay. We just try to keep it PG because it, I Gary like to, Not me, Gary. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, and, and Keith, Keith's a riot, so, oh, yes. the, and, and Keith also has his own show over on the Best Steven Seagal Show, which I just love that name. 3 p.m. on Mondays. You guys can check that. He's talking about uh, Deep Space, not Deep Space Nine. Oh my God, Babylon Five. He's talking Babylon Five. I think he's in season three now, breaking down every episode, talking about how great this series is, and it is a fantastic series. And Keith is amazing. So, um, we also have our good friends at the Nerd Informant, oh down in Branson, um, talking about uh, all their movies that they see. They also have their Nerd Informants Beyond site that people can go on put stuff in and uh, that way things get talked about uh, over with our, our OzCon with uh, the OzPod gals. They are on Thursday nights on Facebook at six o'clock. And of course we've got our partner, um, the Scallywag himself, Spoo, who um, we, we send our, our thoughts with. He's still going through some health issues, but uh, Spoo and, and the Scallywag production should be back to the beginning of the year doing all their broadcasting. And of course we've got, our site, geekycool.com, where we post articles, movie trailers, all sorts, anything geeky. We've got all sorts of people writing for us, talking about anime, talking about everything we can we can figure out to talk about. So, guys, if you're not checking us out, please check us out. And again, thank you, Jason. We appreciate you coming on, my friend. It, it, it has been a long time. We need to get together. I know you're busy because not only are you making movies, and by the way, a movie writer, director, creator, you're, you're everything. You're, you're really awesome. So uh, I always always appreciate talking to you, but we need to get together sometime off of set, maybe go grab a drink and some food sometime. I would love that. Yeah, let me, me know. Too. All right, we'll do. Good luck Friday night. You will you will kill it, and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing this on Netflix or, or um, Disney Plus or somewhere soon. They'll pick this thing up, I'm hoping, so. Never know. <laughs> and my well, uh, exactly. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Until next week. Oh, uh, before I forget, I almost went off and forgot this. Geek Miss is Saturday. So we've got Friday night. We've got uh, Flying Greek. We've got Geek Miss Saturday over um, at the, uh, I don't know, I'm forgetting the name of the place. Oh, my gosh. Um, but it's here in Springfield, Missouri. You guys make sure to check that out also. And now we'll, we'll sign off and say thank you guys for joining us. Stay geeky, and we'll talk to you later. See you guys later.